committee for the, the Elkins Award Lecture. So let me tell you a little bit about the history of this. The Elkins Lecture was first given in 1991 in memory of Tom Elkins by, and, and the whole thing was set up by his doctoral and postdoctoral mentors, Barry Ganetsky and Corey Goodman. So um, in his uh, doctoral work at University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, Tom had worked on the slowpoke mutant and did pioneering electrophysiological studies that showed that slowpoke um, was uh, missing a calcium activated potassium channel and other kinds of information that suggested that the gene encoded the, um, was the structural gene encoding the, uh, the channel. And that did turn out to be th the case. And lots of people have, um, have worked on that since in both Drosophila and the orthologs and other species. So um, after graduate school, Tom went on to Corey Goodman's lab to do his postdoctoral work, and he generated and characterized fasciclin 1 and fasciclin 3 mutations, um, again made, making pioneering discoveries that have benefited many people uh, in the field. And then in October of 1989, right ar uh, around the time, right before this particular conference, he was returning from a camping trip in Yosemite, and he was killed by a drunk driver on the road. So for the people who knew and cared about Tom, this was a, a truly tragic and senseless death. And it was in an effort to try to make something positive in honor um, of, his, uh, of his memory that a small endowment was, um, was put together with, um, uh, by his friends and, and family to support this award lectureship. And the idea is uh, every two years to, um, to grant the, the award and the privilege of giving this talk at, at our meeting to a graduate student who has do, done exceptionally creative and significant work during his or her uh, doctoral dissertation. So the, um, the nominations come from dissertation uh, supervisors with various kinds of supporting uh, documentation, and the selection committee consists of the current year and the previous year's organizers, and Barry Ganetsky ran it for a long time, and now Alex Kolodkin has, uh, has taken it over. So let me tell you a little bit about this year's winner, Jan Mellon. Um, so Jan got her uh, bachelor's degree in biochemistry and cell biology at UCSD before going to MIT where she was a graduate student in the biology program with Troy Littleton. And it's interesting that Troy himself had been an Elkins Award winner back in 1995. Um, so she has actually completed her degree requirements and, um, and has, um, has gone on to uh, a postdoc at Stanford, but she will tell us about her doctoral work this evening uh, in a talk entitled Visualizing Calcium, Insights into Quantal Synaptic Transmission and Cortex Glial Function. Join me in welcoming Jan Mellum. Hi, thank you very much, Linda. Um, and before I w uh, start, I just wanted to give a big thanks to my mentor, Troy Littleton, who has been such an excellent scientist and supporter of myself and all the students in his lab um, over the years. And I think Troy has put together a really great group of people who do excellent science and also have a great time doing it as well. So thank you to them. I'm really grateful I got to be part of this lab. <coughs> So today I want to tell you um, two separate stories. In fact, they bear little relationship to each other, other than the fact that they both involve calcium imaging. Now both of these stories involve calcium imaging performed either in intact animals or in semi-intact uh, preparations of the neuromuscular junction. And so to, um, to, to do this calcium imaging, um, the first story will take place at the synapse, the neuromuscular junction. The second story took place in cortex glia of the central nervous system. We took advantage of the G-CAMPs, which all of you in the audience are well familiar with. Um, so G-CAMPs developed by Lauren Luger um, increase in fluorescence in response to binding calcium. And by itself, G-CAMP is a uh, soluble cytosolic protein. 
that when expressed in a cell of interest will fill the volume of the cell. But as you know, in the nervous system, many important um, signaling events take place at the cell membrane. And so to detect near membrane um, calcium transients, we decided to tag the N-terminus of GCANT with a meristillation sequence, which tethers the sensor to the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. And as I'll show you tonight, we found that this meristillated GCANT5 sensor enables us to detect small near membrane calcium transients, both at the neuromuscular junction and also in cortex glia. <coughs> so in the first project I'm going to discuss, we use calcium imaging to study the process of synaptic transmission which of course occurs when an action potential travels down a presynaptic neuron and induces neurotransmitter release that is packaged in multiple synaptic vesicles. These vesicles um, dump neurotransmitter into the synapse and they bind to postsynaptic receptors, triggering postsynaptic calcium influx, which in the postsynaptic cell or the muscle in the case of the neuromuscular junction, um, triggers an excitatory postsynaptic potential and continues the chain of information flow. However, in the background, um, occurring at a low basal rate are spontaneous potentials, or minis, which are single synaptic vesicle fusion events that occur at every chemical synapse studied thus far. So um, whether receptors on the postsynaptic cell have the ability to distinguish vesicles released during evoked or action potential dependent neurotransmission or spontaneous release has been rather unclear. And so um, one of the questions I want to address in this, in this work is whether, in fact, this postsynaptic cell can distinguish these two vesicular release modes. So we sought to understand how evoked and spontaneous synaptic transmission is regulated at the level of an individual active zone at the neuromuscular junction. Classically, neurotransmission at the NMJ and at many synapses is studied by electrophysiology. And as you know, this gives you a measure of the population of neurotransmitter that is released. Um, but it doesn't tell you much about where this neuro these neurotransmitter vesicles are released at the synapse. <clears throat> and so we use the larval neuromuscular junction as our model synapse, which is the connection of a single motor neuron to the larval muscle. At this synapse, stimulation of the motor neuron causes um, postsynaptic calcium influx and muscle contraction. Uh, visualized here by postsynaptic expression of meristillated GCAMP5. The single, a single neuromuscular junction has multiple swellings, or boutons, and at each swelling um, there exists multiple release sites, or active zones. Each of these active zones, um, shown here labeled with the protein, uh, an antibody against the protein Bush pilot, um, is opposed postsynaptically by clustered glutamate receptors. And shown here at muscle four, you can see that um, there are many such active zones at each bouton. In fact, there are on average 20 boutons at muscle four and about five to 30 active zones per bouton, which gives you a total of about 300 to 350 release sites per synapse. We chose to focus our analysis of quantal synaptic transmission at muscle four because it is a relatively simply, uh, has a relatively simple structure and uh, has these large type 1D boutons. So our lab was not the first to use calcium imaging to study quantal <coughs> synaptic transmission at the FLY NMJ. The Isaacoff lab at UCLA has published several nice papers um, using a different sensor, synapse at GCAMP2, which is a postsynaptically expressed um, and postsynaptically tethered sensor to study um, evoked neurotransmission at the NMJ. And they made several interesting observations. And I think the most important being that uh, when you look at the um, population of active zones at the synapse and look at their uh, release probability in terms of um, their evoked release prob probability, you see that there are a large number of active zones which have a high release probability and a small number of active zones which have, uh, uh, sorry, a, small, a large number of active zones which have a very low release probability and a small number of active zones which have a very high release probability. <coughs> so we wanted to um, build on this work by using meristillated GCAM5 to detect both evoked and spontaneous vesicle fusion events at the NMJ. So we could ask uh, further questions about how these vesicular release modes are related, um, whether they occur at the same active zone, and whether there's any sort of spatial um, patterns of release that we can pick out. And before I describe our results, I wanted to point out that this work would not be possible without the contributions of Yuli Akdorganova, a postdoc in Troizov, who is also here tonight and who is an electrophysiological genius, and Jeff Kubornik, a postdoc in Mark Baer's lab who did a lot of the hard math for us. 
So by virtue of being a membrane tethered tag, we found that expression of Mercilita GCAMP5 postsynaptically, um, or in the musta cell, actually concentrated it postsynaptically, likely because um, the muscle cell has these infoldings of membranes called the subsynaptic reticulum, which concentrates plasma membrane opposite of actosomes. And so we found this is a, a typical example of the expression of Mercilita GCAMP5 postsynaptically when the synapse is at rest and not being stimulated. As you can see, there is um, spontaneous neurotransmission occurring at the synapse, and we can pick out individual um, spontaneous release events occurring in real time all across the synapse. We performed this imaging in a physiological amount of external calcium, which is one and a half millimolar, and we took the images using a spinning disk confocal, which allowed us to image at about eight hertz. And we found that under these conditions, we could acquire continuous imaging sessions of a single synapse from about uh, four to 10 minutes of length, during which the release frequency of spontaneous events and the delta F of the GCAMP remain stable. So here's an example of spontaneous neurotransmission producing a postsynaptic calcium influx at a single site. We found that um, uh, multiple subsequent events at the same site, as shown in these two panels, uh, produced postsynaptic calcium profiles that looked rather identical which allowed us to follow um, subsequent release events at the same release site. So we did this um, sort of analysis for several minutes at each neuromuscular junction, and we found that spontaneous neurotransmission occurs all across the synaptic arbor. We did some post-talk staining with act the active zone marker Bushpilos, and again we saw that um, these postsynaptic calcium ROIs appear to co-localize with um, presynaptic active zones. However, as you can see from these two arrows here, we picked up a number of BRP puncta that did not appear to overlap with postsynaptic calcium influx. These sites could represent active zones that are outside the um, plane of imaging during our imaging sessions. However, as I'll show you a little bit later in the talk, many of such sites were active during evoked neurotransmission. <coughs> so this slide is showing you that these postsynaptic, spontaneous postsynaptic calcium events that we are imaging correlate very strongly with miniature EPFTs or minis. Um, so this is uh, four consecutive imaging frames that we took from one of our series in which four different postsynaptic calcium events are detected with GCAMP. And here is a, a trace of the uh, membrane cell voltage during this period of time showing four minis. And as you can see, um, the time of the frames has been aligned to this uh, trace and you can identify when uh, the minis occurred in this method. And by performing this analysis, we found that about 82% of the minis that we had, had detected optically, 82% of the minis that we had detected in our traces were also seen optically with Mercilita GCAMP5. So we think that the remaining 18% of events um, may be uh, events that occurred outside the plane of imaging. <coughs> when we looked at how many events um, that we detected with GCAMP were also on our traces, we found that almost 100% of all of the spontaneous calcium events were in fact minis. When we looked at the very rare um, instances in which we couldn't detect an obvious event on our physiological trace, we often saw complex postsynaptic voltage events, as shown here, which likely um, reflect the simultaneous spontaneous fusion of three vesicles, which would be hard to differentiate physiologically, but with GCAMP, you can resolve them as occurring across the synaptic arbor. So we took this tool and generated a data set of spontaneous fusion at the neuromuscular junction. So in this data set, what we did is we imaged eight neuromuscular junction uh, muscle force synapses for an average of five minutes each. And we counted the number of spontaneous events that occurred at each ROI or release site. This movie shows you all of the spontaneous events that we tabulated for one such synapse. Uh, the movie has been greatly sped up and also the duration of each calcium event was exaggerated to let you see them better. This is a heat map showing um, the exact data from the synapse, where each release site is color-coded as to its spontaneous release frequency, with highly releasing sites in red and low-releasing sites in blue. We noticed when we looked at this sort of data that we could identify release sites with very high and very low release probabilities existing right next to each other at the synapse, separated by likely no more than uh, one micrometer or less. 
indicating that the rate of spontaneous neurotransmission can be regulated at the level of individual active nodes. When we looked at the population of active zones in our spontaneous neurotransmission data set, in, this is shown in the blue line, uh, with the probability of spontaneous neurotransmission on the y-axis, oh, no, sorry, with the um, event count on the, y, on the x-axis of spontaneous neurotransmission and the proportion of active zones on the y-axis, we saw that there was a large proportion of active zones which had a very low release probability for spontaneous neurotransmission and a small population of active zones which had a very high release probability, which as you'll remember is uh, reflecting the evoked release probability distribution that the Isakoff lab uh, noted. Um, in fact, when we, just to put some numbers on this so you can um, have it better in your head, the average release rate at any active zone at the neuromuscular junction was around 0.012 hertz, which is the release of one vesicle every 81 seconds. And the highest active zone that we noted in our data set had a frequency of release of one vesicle every 12 seconds. So as you can see, the um, release probability of these sites can vary very dramatically. Anecdotally, we also observed that spontaneous fusion can arise at the same release site with a very short temporal delay. So we found several examples in which minis would come from the same active zone um, within several hundred milliseconds which given our imaging frequency is the minimum possible um, uh, time that we could resolve between two events. So for example, this movie shows you two spontaneous <coughs> events arising from what appears to be the same release site within 800 milliseconds of each other. And we thought this was interesting because it implies that if there is um, some sort of refractory period between fusing a vesicle and an active zone between before the next vesicle can fuse, it's not very long. We also wanted to know whether there was any sort of spatial relationship between active zones of high or low release probability at the synapse. And so to ask this question, we defined um, highly releasing active zones um, in each synapse as an active zone which has a release probability that's two standard deviations above the average. And at this synapse, those sites are shown in purple circles. And then for all the other active zones, we um, define them as being either near or far to highly active ROIs based on a measure of distance. This graph shows you the range of distances we tested. And interestingly, we found that at two and a half microns, there was a significant effect such that um, active zones, which are within two and a half microns of a highly active ROI, tend to have a, a significantly higher release rate themselves. In fact, the release rate was about 20% of average. Whereas active zones that are more than two and a half microns from a highly active ROI had a release rate that was more like 80% of average on average. And this suggests that there is um, whatever signaling mechanism may be regulating active zone release probability for spontaneous neurotransmission, um, it can have an effect over a small neighborhood of active zones. In fact, two and a half microns is about the diameter of a very small synaptic gluton. So in addition to finding that um, spontaneous release probability can be, leveled, can be regulated at the level of individual sites, we also have some evidence to think that there is a more neighborhood-like um, effect. <coughs> so to visualize evoked neurotransmission at the neuromuscular junction, we simulated the larval motor neuron at a very low frequency, about once every three seconds. And we found that we could visualize evoked neurotransmission which is the synchronous release of multiple synaptic vesicles. We performed this imaging in a slightly lower amount of calcium and an uh, elevated level of magnesium, which inhibits contraction of the muscle cell, which is important for doing this analysis. And it also reduces the quantum content of each stimulation. So we can see um, the number of vesicles very clearly across the arbor. And we also found that this, uh, this particular concentrations allowed us to have a good delta F to resolve these events. And so using um, the low frequency of evoked um, of, of simulation, we generate a second data set of um, neurotransmission in which evoked and spontaneous release are occurring simultaneously at these synapses. And for this, we imaged seven synapses for an average of three and a half minutes each. And we collected um, about 1,500 active sites or 1,400 active zones and about 5,000 calcium events of which 55% um, were due to evoked release and 45% were due to spontaneous release. <coughs> 
So here's the data from two of the synapses in our data set. There's one synapse at the top and one synapse at the bottom. And we've separated the types of release events for you post hoc, such that spontaneous neurotransmission is shown on the left and evoked neurotransmission is shown on the right. For each synapse, uh, the, an ROI, or a presumably an active zone, is um, shown in a white dot. And again, we've exaggerated the length of time a postsynaptic calcium event is shown to give you a better idea of how they are distributed. So when we looked at the population of active zones as to their evoked release probability, we noticed a very similar trend, such that very, a lot of the active zones, in fact, um, a, a, most of them, had a very low release probability given a stimulation. So again, this is just looking at evoked release. And there are some outliers down on the right side of the x-axis, which are active zones that had a very high release of probability, so were very likely to release a vesicle in, in response to a stimulation event. And this um, release probability histogram is very similar, again, to the um, data uh, gathered by the Isaacoff group, in which they used synaptid GCAMP2 to measure evoked release probability to active zones. But given that we were able to measure both spontaneous and evoked neurotransmission at the same synapse, we were able to then categorize active zones as either participating in evoked-only neurotransmission, spontaneous-only neurotransmission, or mixed-mode being both evoked and released neurotransmission at the same site. And as you can see, we identified a very significant fraction of active zones that it fell into the evoked only or spontaneous only categories. In fact, um, about 40% of active zones uh, that we found in our uh, first data set, were only 40% uh, participated in both mo modes of vesicle fusion. Again, anecdotally, we observed, um, so here, shown here is a an active zone that we've labeled as the mixed mode release site and that it um, has a spontaneous event right here and then um, a few seconds, a second later it has an evoked vesicle fusion event. Um, again, showing that vesicle fusion events at the same active zone can occur with very little temporal delay. But we wondered whether these evoked only and spontaneous only release sites that we um, categorized um, actually had a, just a very low release probability for the other mode of fusion. So to determine if this was the case, we performed additional 10 minute long imaging sessions where we were stimulating at a low basal frequency. And interestingly, we found that the proportion of active zones which were only releasing vesicles spontaneously remained stable at about 22 to 23%. And to us, this suggested that there are, there may be in fact a population of active zones that only participate in spontaneous release and in fact are silent for evoked release. When we perform post hoc staining for active zones, um, shown here as one single synaptic gluton, and the active zones that, or the, the ROIs that only participate in spontaneous neurotransmission are shown in white circles, we saw that they appeared to roughly overlap with um, active zone staining presynaptically, suggesting that these spontaneous only release sites likely do not represent fusion of, fusion of a synaptic vesicle outside of an active zone. Again, we generated heat maps of spontaneous and evoked fusion at the synapse. So shown here is one synapse where the, um, all of the release sites at the synapse are color-coded as to their probability of spontaneous release. And all of these sites, again, are color-coded as to their probability of evoked release. Um, and as you can see, there doesn't seem to be any strong correlation between these two patterns. And on, on the third, we've identified sites um, shown in blue, which we labeled, which were spontaneous only in our imaging period, sites in yellow that were evoked only, and sites in green that exhibited both spontaneous and evoked neurotransmission. So for the green sites, which were about two thirds or maybe sometimes 40% of the sites of the synapse, we wanted to know are these, pattern, are these release probabilities for spontaneous and evoked neurotransmission related at these single sites? You would expect that they would be related, um, for example, if there was a site that had a very high release probability for spontaneous release and also had a high probability for evoked release, if there was a single um, mechanism regulating release probability at each active zone. But in fact, we found that spontaneous and evoked release probability don't appear to be correlated at single active zones. So 
In this chart, um, each active zone that um, was green in this picture and exhibited both modes of release is shown in a blue dot. And its spontaneous release probability is on the y-axis and its evoked release probability is on the x-axis. And our best fit line for the data is shown here. And there doesn't seem to be any significance to this um, small, small correlation, suggesting that um, evoked and spontaneous release can be independently regulated at the same active zone. We are also interested in knowing whether the spatial clustering effect that we observed at the synapse um, would be true if we looked at evoked neurotransmission as well as spontaneous neurotransmission. So in this image, um, the synapses are color-coded as to their overall release probability, including both spontaneous and evoked release. And we performed the same analysis I described earlier where we identified highly active release sites that were more than two standard deviations above average in blue circles and defined all the other sites in relation to those sites as a measure of distance of two and a half microns. And we found the same finding in this data set, which is that sites that were closer to the high releasing sites had a slightly higher release rate themselves. <coughs> and sites that were lower to those, or two and a half microns or more away from those sites had a slightly lower release rate. Again, suggesting a small but significant um, clustering effect of highly active release sites at the synapse. So the final question we were interested in addressing with this um, imaging sensor was whether active zones are releasing one vesicle or potentially multiple vesicles when they are stimulated. So uh, one possibility is that uh, stimulation causes evoked release of one vesicle at every active zone that's going to participate. The other option is that some active zones may fuse two or more vesicles. And so to address this question, we looked at the delta F of the GCAMP response for evoked and spontaneous release at every active zone that had both evoked and spontaneous release. So we were comparing um, internally the delta F fluorescence at a single site um, across multiple sites, of course. And we found that the change in fluorescence was very similar for both modes of fusion, suggesting that um, evoked release involves a single vesicle fusion event. As well, the calcium profile itself was um, highly identical. And um, we did observe uh, about 2% of the time that there would be an evoked release event, uh, a green line, that had an amplitude about twofold higher than the spontaneous G-CAMP event, indicating that perhaps in rare instances, active zones are capable of fusing a couple synaptic vesicles. So in summary, we performed postsynaptic calcium imaging at the neuromuscular junction and made several observations about parental synaptic transmission. Uh, the first thing I showed you is that expression of um, mercillated GCAMP5 postsynaptically will enable us to detect the majority of evoked and spontaneous fusion events at the NMJ, making it one of the most um, sensitive sensors to date. We found that spontaneous and evoked release probability are highly variable at all active zones. There are a lot of active zones um, that are, have a low release probability for both modes of fusion and a very small number of active zones that have a high release probability. And at active zones that have both modes of fusion, we found that there was no significant correlation between their two release keys, suggesting that both modes of fusion are independently regulated at synapses. When we simulated the neuromuscular junction, as I just showed you, we have data suggesting that single vesicles are normally released from active zones. And we found a, a, a small but significant spatial clustering effect for highly releasing active zones suggesting that a mechanism regulating evoked and spontaneous release can spread over an area encompassing multiple such active zones. And I think our most interesting observation in this work was that a significant proportion of release sites at the synapse, up to 22%, and ranging from about 10 to 40%, depending on the synapse, appear to specialize only in spontaneous neurotransmission and are silent for evoked release. We found it really interesting that there may be active zones that are specialists for spontaneous neurotransmission um, because that suggests that there are postsynaptic glutamate receptors that are only seeing spontaneous release, suggesting that the muscle cell has the ability to discriminate between spontaneous neurotransmission and evoked neurotransmission. And so there's two different information channels that the muscle can get. So what is the purpose of spontaneous neurotransmission? Um, this has been... Uh, a little unclear, but there have been a number of um, uh, thoughts put forward and some good evidence for all of these. I just wanted to mention them. 
One is that um, spontaneous neurotransmission is a mechanism the synapse uses to uh, mature and become stable. And several groups have shown that maize can regulate protein synthesis postsynaptically. So perhaps some of these spontaneous only active zones may represent immature synapses. Um, work from our lab and others has shown that minis are required for activity-dependent synaptic growth at the Drosophila neuromuscular junction, such that um, spontaneous release frequency strongly correlates with synaptic growth. And finally, um, minis have been long implicated in synaptic plasticity. So as uh, we heard earlier tonight, acute blockade of minis can rapidly enhance uh, synaptic strength. And the Gray Davis's lab at UC San Francisco has done a lot of work on this particular plasticity mechanism called homeostatic plasticity, which strongly depends on minis. And we thought it was really interesting that the average um, spontaneous release rate we identified at active zones, which is about one per 81 seconds, is very similar to the induction of neuromuscular junction plasticity, which is about two to three minutes. And this suggests possibly that the um, muscle cell is capable of detecting a change in release um, on the order of one to two vesicles and initiating some sort of signaling event to the neuron um, to induce this plasticity. And so in the future, we think it would be really interesting to identify whether there is some sort of um, postsynaptic um, molecular clock for calcium that can detect such a short change in, um, in release frequency. So at these uh, active zones where we identified both synapse spontaneous and evoked release, we were wondering how could these vesicle fusion events be independently regulated at the same active zone. Um, there are a number of mechanisms worth speculating about for a moment. Um, one is that uh, Yves Trevally's group has put forward this idea that there are different synaptic vesicle pools at the same active zone, which may mediate both types of release. And um, it could be that vesicles in these pools uh, recycle through separate mechanisms and don't mix. That could be a way in which they could be differentially regulated. <clears throat> There's also been some work showing that spontaneous release um, may be due to the use of non-canonical snares, which is the presynaptic release machinery for synaptic vesicle fusion, or that um, spontaneous neurotransmission could um, involve different biophysical actions between, between snare proteins. One such um, intriguing molecule that could be involved in this sort of um, modulation is the protein complexin, which Troy's lab has done um, some work, a lot of work on. Complexin is a small snare binding fusion clamp. Um, and what's interesting is that the levels of complexin at the neuromuscular junction can dramatically bidirectionally regulate mini release frequency. So in this video, um, in real time, you're seeing a spontaneous release from a complexin null neuromuscular junction in which the mini release frequency was elevated about 30 to 40 fold. And also, um, overexpression of complexin can dampen this spontaneous release. Interestingly, different splicing isoforms of complexin and probably phosphorylation of complexin can differentially regulate evoked and spontaneous release, which um, is very exciting and suggests a possible mechanism by which active zones could acutely tune their release probability for these two mechanisms. So given um, our ability now to use Merislata GCAMP5 to generate release probability maps for both evoked and spontaneous neurotransmission at the NMJ, we want to begin to uh, investigate these mechanisms genetically and see how perturbing um, any of these molecules could affect um, release probability. So um, now I want to switch gears completely and talk about a totally unrelated project um, but again, involving calcium imaging. And this project takes place in the central nervous system and not the neuromuscular junction. So um, the focus of Troy's lab at MIT is to study synaptic transmission. And I just told you about a piece of it um, just a second ago. But he's, we're also interested in identifying neuronal signaling mechanisms that may underlie diseases such as epilepsy. And so one of the things the lab has done is performed a screen for fruit flies that at uh, room temperature um, look normal and at 38 degrees exhibit seizures. So I was working on um, one of these uh, seizure susceptible fruit flies called, we called Zydeco. And um, I found that, well, let me show you real quick. So this is how we would perform such a screen. Uh, we took uh, uh, vials of fruit flies um, and we lowered them into a preheated water bath to 38 degrees. And Zydeco mutants are uh, one of the strongest TS seizure mutants that came out of the screen. 
they'll begin to seize um, upon exposure to this temperature within about 30 seconds, whereas wild type flies um, tolerate it very well. So <coughs> through a combina combination of deficiency mapping and then sequencing, I found that Zydeco mutants are disrupted in a sodium calcium potassium exchanger, or NCKX. NCKX exchangers are plasma membrane proteins that use the sodium and potassium gradients of the cell to export calcium ions. Two alleles of Zydeco are point mutations in the cation region binding of this exchanger, and a third allele it generates an early stop codon. And all three of these alleles are equivalently, equivalent, equivalently temperature sensitive seizure mutants. Um, in Drosophila, there are two NCKX exchangers. This NCKX Zydeco, as I'll show you in a moment, appears to be expressed exclusively in glial cells. Um, a second NCKX may also be expressed in neurons. So in working with these animals, um, we realized that Zydeco mutants are just generally seizure susceptible in response to a variety of environmental stressors. This is where it gets fun. <laughs> so. Um, when, when you expose Zydeco mutants to a uh, cold shock by um, putting them in a petri dish on ice for five minutes and then allowing them to recover at room temperature, we noticed they, they would exhibit these really strong seizures, whereas wild type flies just slowly warm up and then start walking around again. I also noticed as I was transferring these flies that they appeared to be slightly bang sensitive. So if you put Zydeco mutants in a vial and you vortex them for 10 seconds at room temperature, they will also seize for upwards of 30 to 60 seconds. So this shows that these mutants um, seize in response to high temperature, low temperature, and just mechanical stress. We recorded central pattern generator output from larval motor neurons in the Zydeco mutant and found that at the restrictive temperature, these seizures manifest as tonic spiking of the larval motor neurons. Whereas the neuronal activity pattern um, recorded in these mutants at room temperature was more or less indistinguishable from wild type. So in order to determine where Zydeco is required in the nervous system, we performed tissue-specific rescue experiments with um, neuronal-specific driver ELAP-GAL4 or the glial-specific driver RepoGAL4. And as you're seeing in these traces, we found that panglial but not neuronal expression of the transgene fully rescued the seizures both recorded in the, larval, in the larval animal here and also behaviorally as we saw them in the water bath test of adult animals. And so the glia and drosophila um, come in many subpopulations, which you can roughly group as homologous to mammalian glia. There's a couple of glial subpopulations that uh, form the blood-brain barrier and encapsulate the central nervous system. There's a population of cells called ensheathing glia, which are uh, oligodendrocyte-like cells that ensheathe nerves. And there's two populations of glia that are thought to be similar to mammalian astrocytes. That is the astrocyte-like glia, which invade the neuropil and interact with synapses, and cortex glia, which are um, found in the cortical region of the CNS and encapsulate all of the neuronal cell bodies in the brain. By using um, GAL4 drivers, which drive specifically in these different subpopulations, we found that only rescue of the mutant with cortex glial GAL4 could suppress the seizure phenotype. We repeated these experiments with, um, uh, with uh, tissue-specific knockdown of Zydeco by RNAi and again found that cortex glial-specific expression of Zydeco RNAi was sufficient to induce seizures in these animals, showing that um, Zydeco expression only in cortex glia was both necessary and sufficient to um, regulate neuronal seizure susceptibility. <coughs> so I said that Drosophila cortex glia exhibit similarity to mammalian astrocytes, but probably as everyone in this room thinks, when you think about astrocytes, you think about how they associate with synapses. But as um, work from Phil Hayden's lab has shown, um, cortical astrocytes not only uh, interact with synapses, but they also envelop neuronal cell bodies, which are shown here in red. In green is a single cortical astrocyte from a mouse. So similarly, um, in Drosophila, these cortical glial membranes, which are labeled in green with a membrane tethered GFP, um, will encapsulate and sheathe individual neurons shown here in red. And this occurs in the ventral nerve cord and also in the central nervous system. But uh, there's very little known about the in vivo role of cortex glia in the fly. They're one of the more mysterious cell types in the brain. We generated antiseroid of Zydeco and found that indeed um, Zydeco immune reactivity was on these cortex glial membranes. So looking at one hemisphere of the larval CNS, 
we found these large um, chambers of cortex glial membrane that encapsulated groups of neurons. And in the zydeco mutant, the staining was largely abolished. If you zoom in on part of the cortex in the larvae in which um, these cortex glia have begun to individually encapsulate all of the neurons, you can see that zydeco staining is uniform on all of these cortex glial membranes. And we perform the staining in animals, um, I'm not showing here, but in animals in which we'd express RNAi to zydeco in glia, and the staining is gone. However, knocking down the gene in neurons had no, had no effect on this immunostaining. So these cortex glia, as, I, as I'm showing you, are individually enwrapping each neuron in the brain. And although by the larval stage, this hasn't been fully completed in several regions of the central nervous system, um, by the time an animal becomes an adult, each neuron is fully encapsulated. So when is this exchanger required in cortex glia to regulate seizure susceptibility? We figured there were probably two possibilities. One is that you need NCKX, the NCKX zydeco to regulate calcium signaling in cortex glia, and that messing with this can um, make the animal susceptible to seizures. Or that there's some developmental requirements for zydeco that might be important in uh, neuronal wiring that could again um, generate a seizure susceptible phenotype. So to ask this question, we inducibly expressed a wild type zydeco transgene in the mutant animal using HSP70 GAL4, which is a heat inducible GAL4 driver. At room temperature, this driver is off, and so the transgene is not being expressed. And we reared these animals um, from hatching until adulthood at room temperature. Then we gave them a five minute heat pulse and assayed their susceptibility to seizures for um, several days afterwards. And we found that when we acutely induced zydeco expression, that we could eliminate the susceptibility to temperature sensitive seizures within about six hours, showing that acute restore, restorement of zydeco to the nervous system is sufficient to um, reduce susceptibility to temperature, to temperature sensitive seizures, indicating that um, the seizures in these animals are not likely arising due to any developmental defect. So this brings us to the big question, which is how does disruption of zydeco affect calcium regulation in these cortex glia. <clears throat> so this is an electron micrograph of two neurons in the Drosophila brain separated by a cortex glial cell. And as you can appreciate from this picture, um, cortex glial membranes between neurons are extremely thin. They're on the average of less than 100 nanometers. And we f I found that when um, we expressed cytosolic calcium indicators such as Chi camp or the chameleons, there wasn't much expression in these membranes and we couldn't see much at all. So this is where the Merce-related GCAMP5 sensor comes in really well because since it's tethered to the inner leaflet of the membrane, it can diffuse in these cortex wheel much better. So when we express Merce-related GCAMP5 in the larval nerve, or with, in, with the repo driver, so in glia, we found that um, we found very dynamic um, small calcium transients occurring all the time in cortex glia. So this is an image of a live third and star Drosophila larvae that's been <coughs> gently pressed beneath a cover slip. And you're looking at the uh, dorsal surface of the middle of the ventral nerve cord. All of these membranes in white are uh, cortex glial membranes. And all of the dark circles in between are likely neuron cell bodies or sometimes um, glial cell bodies. And as you can see, there are lots of little calcium transients occurring in these cortex glia that are highly localized. And in some cases, we can even see what appears to be calcium flowing through perhaps multiple cortex glial cells, though we don't know that for sure at this time. Um, the reason why I'm doing this imaging through a live animal is because we found that dissection um, or even anesthesia caused rapid elimination of all of this activity. So we don't yet have a dissected prep that can maintain this cortex glial, um, endogenous cortex glial signaling. So these cortex glial calcium transients occur in small membrane domains on average about four microns um, in area. And they're very fast. Um, they're an average of 1.3 seconds um, from start to finish. And as you can see, they appear to recur um, in the same um, subdomain of the cortex glial uh, membrane in sheathing a single <coughs> neuronal cell body, suggesting the presence of some sort of structural or functional subdomain in these cortex glia. We found that in wild type animals, these transients would occur at uh, room temperature, as shown here, and also in the hyperthermic condition of 38 degrees Celsius, as shown here. 
when we looked at this cortex wheel of calcium activity in vitamins, we were really surprised to see that these transients are completely abolished. So this is the activity in a wild type uh, ventral nerve cord um, at three times wheel speed, and this is the activity in the zydeco ventral nerve cord. So does this suggest that these um, zydeco mutant, that these um, calcium transients in zydeco mutant cortex glia might play some sort of important role in regulating the brain's susceptibility to seizures? The second observation we made about calcium was that it appeared that calcium in zydeco mutant glia were, was elevated above um, baseline. So the, the mercellated G camp 5 fluorescence in the nerve cord of a zydeco mutant was um, significantly higher than in wild type animals. So showing that calcium is just basally upregulated throughout the glial cells. We found that when we shifted the animals to 38 degrees, which is the temperature inducing seizures, that the calcium further increased. Um, which has been, and, and as well you can appreciate that in wild type animals, um, a temperature shift also induces a small increase in glial calcium. And this temperature dependent shift in, um, temperature dependent increase in calcium has been observed at uh, the neuromuscular junction in larvae, or in flies, um, and it's thought to be due to a decrease in the amount of um, calcium de other calcium dependent export mechanisms, such as the PMCA, which depends on ATP, which appears to get depleted under hypothermic conditions. So knowing these two things, one, that zydeco mutants lack these um, cortex glial calcium transients, and two, that zydeco mutants have just higher basal um, calcium in their glia, we hypothesized two possibilities to explain the seizures in these animals. One is that these calcium transients may reduce the susceptibility of the brain to seizure activity via some mechanisms. And two, that uh, there is some overall calcium threshold in cortex glia, and if you exceed this threshold, you can trigger a seizure event. And, I, and, uh, and so I'm showing you here that hyperthermia can induce a, a, a jump in calcium, but it could also be true that something like a cold shock or maybe mechanical stress could also <coughs> acutely dysregulate glial calcium and thus push the level of calcium in these mutant glia above this threshold. So we wanted to try to discriminate these two possibilities, and we thought a way to do that might be to try to manipulate intracellular calcium in glia using um, something completely separate from the zydeco mean. So here we're turning to the trip channel, which as you know um, is closed at room temperature and opens around 26 degrees and allows calcium to flow inside. As we've heard um, uh, yesterday, these trip channels are only expressed in thermotactic neurons at the head of the fly and are not normally found in glia. So we were able to express trip A1 in these cortex glia ectopically, and that allowed us to tune the level of intracellular calcium and ask what would happen in a wild type animal. So in this video, um, flies are sitting on a putty that's going to be heated um, from 25 degrees up, and flies expressing trip A1 in cortex glia are in this panel. Flies expressing trip A1 um, with ELAV and all of their neurons are in this panel, and these are control flies. <coughs> so we found that as the temperature increased, um, we could observe seizures arising in um, these animals in which calcium is flooding into the cortex glia. And that these seizures appeared to occur um, with a similar sort of onset and intensity as the seizures we would observe in animals in which the neurons are being directly activated. So as you can see, the, the seizure is here, and the animals are also um, twitching their legs and uh, not moving around anymore. We recorded central pattern generator activity from larvae of these genotypes and found that the seizure onset um, was very similar whether we were flooding calcium into the neurons or elevating calcium into the cortex glia. In fact, these seizures both manifested as tonic spiking of the larval motor neurons, which is the same sort of pattern we saw in the zydeco mutant. To us, this suggests that um, the second possibility is more likely, that if you exceed some level of calcium in a cortex glial cell, you can acutely trigger a signal um, from the glial cell that induces a seizure. And at this time, we still don't know the biological purpose of these small um, one second or so calcium transients that are arising in cortex glia. That's still a mystery. So finally, we wanted to ask, what is this mechanism downstream of calcium in cortex glia that can contribute to seizure activity? So turning to the literature from the mammals, there's um, some several papers from the last decade showing that um, seizures in mammalian systems 
are correlated with high levels of calcium in astrocytes. And one proposed mechanism by which astrocytic calcium can trigger um, neuronal seizures is through this idea of gliotransmission, which is where calcium in an astrocyte can trigger um, or astrocyte-derived glutamate release, which binds to NMDA receptors on neurons and can trigger synchronous neuronal currents. And this has been observed to occur in neurons that are about 100 microns distant in the cortex, suggesting that a highly active glial cell, such as an astrocyte or perhaps a cortex glial cell, could synchronously activate a population of nearby neurons and will perhaps lead to a seizure event. So to identify the mechanism occurring in zydeco mutants, we turned to a um, genetic suppressor screen approach. And we wanted to um, ask what genes are required in fly glia to mediate the seizure activity. And as a first pass, we um, identified a list of genes that are proposed to mediate vesicular exocytosis in mammalian astrocytes, perhaps to get at this question of whether gliotransmission can underlie any sort of seizure, seizure phenotype. So this is how the screen was set up. In the zydeco mutant um, with a panglial driver, we crossed that to um, a, a RNAi hairpin targeting a single gene. And in the next generation, we asked, um, in these animals, do they still exhibit seizures at 30 degrees Celsius? And so in our suppressor screen, one of our first hits was in the protein calmodulin, which is a small, um, highly conserved protein uh, that mediates many different calcium-dependent functions and is ubiquitous in every cell type. We found that knocking down calmodulin with RNAi um, did knock down the protein. And we found that when we expressed calmodulin <coughs> RNAi in glia, we had a 100% rescue of the seizures in these zydeco mutants. And shown here is the ethnid trace of CCG activity in the neuromuscular junction, um, showing that zydeco mutants um, lacking calmodulin in their glia exhibit a normal pattern of um, motor activity at the restricted temperature. This suggests that calcium um, in the cortex glial cell proceeds to, through some kind of calmodulin-dependent pathway to mediate whatever signal is then driving the seizure activity in the neurons. So we're currently following up on a number of additional hits in the screen, in which we have found approximately 18 out of 750 genes that appear to modulate the seizures in these mutants when knocked down in, um, in the glial cells. And it'll be interesting in the future to really define this molecular mechanism and identify what is actually triggering um, the seizures in these mutants. So in summary, I've told you about um, the identification of zydeco, a mutant that is predisposed to seizures in response to high, low, and uh, high and low temperatures and also mechanical stress. And it's disrupted in a glial-specific sodium calcium potassium exchanger. Zydeco mutants lack um, cortex glial calcium transients, which we identified as occurring um, endogenously in wild-type animals. And as well as lacking these transients, they exhibit globally elevated intracellular glial calcium. Furthermore, we found with trip A1 that if you acutely elevate calcium in a wild-type animal's cortex glia, you can trigger rapid seizures. And finally, we now know that calmodulin appears to be required for this signaling process in the cortex glial cell. So in our model, um, neurons here are shown in blue, and cortex glial membrane is shown in sheathing them in green. It appears that um, some sort of calcium-dependent signal arising in the cortex glia may trigger firing um, in a neuron, and that zydeco uh, is likely responsible for mediating calcium flux and possibly for terminating these events. So in the future, we'd really like to know more about this neuronal glial signaling pathway that we've uncovered by following up on the hits from our RNAi screen. We're also interested in understanding, um, so that would be this, this question mark here. We're also interested in understanding how these cortex glial calcium signals correlate with neuronal activity. Are they induced by activity? Do they induce activity themselves? Um, we'd really like to perform simultaneous GCAMP imaging of these transients while stimulating um, neurons, possibly with channel endosmin or something of that, to get at a, a relationship between the two modes of firing. And finally, um, We'd like to perform flipped um, experiments where we express GCAMP only in a single cortex glial cell and ask, are these transients um, regulated within, between cortex glia? Does calcium spread within a network or is it highly localized within a single cell? <coughs> and with that, I'd like to thank all of you and also the Littleton Lab um, for being such an excellent group of people to work with at MIT. All of the flies that I killed during the various years. Um, 
Yulia Akrugnova who, and Jeffrey Gubornik, again, who contributed very strongly to this Napid Calcium Imaging Project. Um, all the, these undergrads and Gina who contributed to the Zydeco and cal Cortex Soil Calcium Imaging Project. And I'd like to point out that Yao is a postdoc in the lab who has taken over this project and who has a number of interesting results. His poster is coming up tomorrow, so you should definitely see it. Um, Troy Littleton, again, for being such an excellent mentor. And thank you, and I'll take questions. Questions? Um, that's a great question. We haven't seen any specific subcellular localization with our antibody. It appears to be uniform on all of the cortex little membranes. So at this time, didn't see any sort of zydeco puncta, which would have been very cool. Uh, I just wondered what's actually, uh, oh, sorry, over here. <laughs> um, uh, I just wondered uh, if you were actually able to follow uh, what was happening during a seizure event in terms of uh, the activity of individual or many uh, glial cells. So, for example, um, have you tried any uh, mosaic approaches where some uh, fraction of the glial cells uh, are mutant to get an idea of um, you know, whether you can actually trigger seizures by only a, a, a small number of cells within the population? No, we haven't tried that sort of approach, but that would be really, really interesting, and I think that would be a great thing to try to do. Um, all I can say is we performed our calcium imaging under conditions in which the larvae would be experiencing a seizure under uh, 38 degrees, and we didn't see anything pop out um, other than that um, global elevation of intracellular calcium that I showed. Yeah, I sort of avalanche. There's a question in the back. Yeah, I actually have a couple of questions about the uh, first part of the talk. Uh, and my first one has to do with uh, your detection of uh, multivesicle release, or I guess failure to detect multivesicle release from uh, single uh, points of interest. And I may have missed the data, but did you show whether you have a, a saturation level of your G-camp sensor by single uh, boutons, or uh, sorry, single vesicle release? Uh, a saturating level? No, um, but if we increase external calcium in the bath, we can increase the delta F of the signal. So uh, that indicates to me that the, the G camp isn't actually being saturated. When we okay, detect yeah, that, that, that's what I was getting at. Mm -hmm. uh, my second question then quick uh, was, I believe the, one of the big findings from the Isaacoff paper was that there seems to be a strengthening of uh, synaptic release along the length of the motor axon. And it didn't look like your data was in agreement with that. So I guess yeah. can you shed some light on that? Yeah, um, in fact, uh, so what the Isaacoff group found was that terminal boutons on the neuromuscular junction tended to have a higher than average release rate as opposed to um, the more proximal boutons. And we performed a similar analysis with our data, but we did not see any sort of bouton-specific um, trend with evoked or spontaneous neurotransmission related to the distal bouton. And so that data is quantified here. So in fact, our finding was not quite the same as the Isaacoff group, um, which we may chalk up to the fact that we were detecting possibly more events with our most rated GCAMP5 sensor. Any other questions? Have those yes, um, the Zydeco mutant, um, once you return it to room temperature, it gets up after about a minute or two. It appears, interestingly, that the duration of its recovery can actually be related to the duration of the temperature shock. Uh, but they do recover. I've got a quick question. Did, did you mention the stoichiometry of numbers of glia to numbers of neuronal cell bodies? I did not. Um, it's really interesting. I think um, the number of cortex glia in the ventral nerve cord has been counted, um, and I think it's on the order of less than 100 or so. Oh, okay. Um, I don't quote me on that. Um, but but <laughs> But it's many more neurons. I believe more than neurons length, than yeah. glia. And so we'd really like to know, for example, how many neurons does one cortex glial ensheath? Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be a really interesting question to approach mosaically. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you, Jen, again. And we'll see everybody back at 9. <laughs>